Good morning, Victory Church family and friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. And we do so because uh, if you're listening to my voice right now, actually, it means you're above ground, you're breathing, and, and it means then we have the opportunity to walk more uprightly today than we did yesterday. Uh, the opportunity to offer worship and praise from our lives and our lips to a Heavenly Father who is so deserving of it all. And so we do rejoice in Jesus today. My name is Paul. I am privileged to serve as pastor of Victory Church of Charlottesville, where we exist to see people reconciled to God and to each other. And to say that I miss seeing you in person would be a gross understatement. Um, absolutely grateful for this medium, but I miss you and miss you dearly uh, and look forward to when we can be back fellowshipping in person again. Uh, there, There's particularly in this season, I think about what in-person gatherings um, could help facilitate by way of encouragement and comfort in a season where we all could definitely benefit. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, and, and yet I am grateful to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for his grace, for this medium again that we have to communicate through. Um, and you should know that we've convened a work group that has been meeting. Uh, we've met two times now and we'll continue to meet over the next two months uh, up until August 1st. So at least for the next two months, we'll be uh, <clears throat> fellowshipping in this way. And during that two months, we'll be talking and praying through uh, how best to transition into in-person gatherings. So maintaining much of this online presence and then phasing in wise and safe uh, in-person gatherings to allow that fellowship uh, that we all miss so much. And so we'll update you as we can uh, and in the meantime, I am grateful for who we are and who we are is is us. It's you. We aren't who we are without you. And certainly we can't be who God's called us to be without you. Um, and so thank you so much for plugging in in the ways that you can uh, in this way, in in our online or uh, via phone prayer every single uh, night, every single Monday night through our victory groups that are online. You can go on our website and find those. Thank you for plugging in. And we're just believing God that the online seeds that we're planting in this season, uh, they're going to reap a harvest that's exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Doing something in all of our hearts and in the hearts of those in our sphere of influence. And so we're just planting what we have and trusting God, as we always do, to give the increase that only he can in our hearts and in our community. I'm also praying um, into 1 Peter 4 and 11 um, these days, which speaks to our serving out of the strength that God provides, which is certainly something that we all need to be doing all the time. Uh, but it's something about seasons like the one that we're in right now that that we realize that we need to be serving out of the strength that he provides. Uh, there's nothing like... Um, an anti-racist lifestyle, which is a part of uh, the life God calls us to live, uh, that reminds me of how much a marathon that it is. It's not a sprint. Um, an anti-racist lifestyle is is it's it's a lifestyle. It's a long-winded marathon that we are on. Um, and we'll be on for some time. So I, I pray in this season with all going on that the same energy, the same focus, the same passion um, that we have now will continue to have when the news cycle shifts, uh, when the news headlines are no longer what it is. Our vision, Victory Church, which is to see people reconciled to God and to each other, was crafted in a time where there weren't uh, a, 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 a sort of a news headline. That, that acknowledged a crisis. But how many know there's always been a crisis? Uh, long before August of 2017 in Charlottesville, there was a crisis. And similarly, uh, when, the, when, when the news above the fold, for those of us who still get the hard copy newspaper, uh, when it shifts to something else, my prayer is that our attention to the full gospel doesn't. And that the same energy and passion and, and, and attention giving to growing in our stewardship of the gospel and our stewardship of reconciliation will be there long after the, uh, the state of emergencies that, that government officials across the nation, um, long after they've been lifted. Um, and I've been doing a lot of reflecting toward that end, as I imagine you are, processing in many ways why I am so exhausted these days. Yes, it's been the, uh, the 
unjust killings of, of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and, uh, and, and many others. It's absolutely been that for sure. Um, and to that end, I can't watch another video. It's too traumatic. Um, the pain and agony, just it's re-traumatizing. However, I'm grateful because if not for some of these viral videos, there may not have been any charges and, 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 and progress toward justice and maybe not have resonated in the hearts of some that it now does, if not for them. I'm just saying for me uh, that it's been tough and, and, and I can't necessarily watch anymore. But I also realize um, as I reflect on the exhaustion, that it's also a function of my realizing the many layers that will still need to be attended to long after uh, this moment, if you will, passes. Um, how tempting it may be for some of us, black and white, Latinx and Asian, uh, to sort of move on and shift focus. Um, but as I always do, I find encouragement in the word of God uh, that tells us that Jesus finished it. On the cross, he said, it is finished. The process of reconciliation was painful, agonizing, but he finished it. And now you and I get the opportunity to become who we already are in the mind of God. Revelation 7 and 9 talks about multitudes that cannot be counted from every nation, from every tribe and every language. We are becoming, as we get the opportunity to endure what will be, no doubt, if invested, a painful, long, difficult, agonizing at times process, we're becoming, though, what we are in Jesus Christ. The promise we have is that he'll meet us here and do the kind of spiritual surgery that all of us need to have produced in and through us that which will allow his will in heaven to be done here on earth as we pray in the Lord's Prayer. He's the hope of glory wanting to be made known in and through all of us. And so I am encouraged by the very fact that we win. We have the victory, 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 says. And so the 58th verse of that chapter then says, so stand firm, be about the work of Jesus Christ because it is not in vain. Amen? Amen. Well, today we're going to begin a new sermon series for the month of June entitled Justice. Justice. And today we'll be speaking from uh, the book of Psalm, chapter 89, verse 14. And before we read that scripture, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. Uh, we pray according to your word. Psalm 119 and 18 says, please open our eyes so that we may see all of the wonderful things in your law for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 89, verse 14. And it reads this way. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. The title of the message this morning is Agency in Justice. Agency in Justice. Um, I find myself at times defining on my own terms the placement of justice. I can remember even growing up when um, <clears throat> my parents would administer justice, if you will. They would discipline me and my siblings. They would, they would often say something to us, and, and, and maybe this resonates or you can identify with this. Drop me a note in the chat if it does. Let me know I'm not alone. But um, they would often say things like, in the process of disciplining or right before, uh, this, is, this, is, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I just remember thinking, what in the world? <laughs> like, that's just foul. That's foul. No, it is not. That is not true at all. Where did that come from? I remember one particular time when my brother was getting disciplined and I was nearby. And, and for some reason, for some reason, I, I started to laugh. I, to this day, I have no idea what possessed me to <laughs> laugh in that moment. But what I know is that my parent turned their attention toward me in that moment, at which point I froze. Right. No more laughing because I knew the justice being administered to my brother was now about to be extended <laughs> and include me. And so I'm frozen there and I'm thinking to myself, no, focus, focus, dad, focus. Do not. No need to hurt you anymore. 
anymore. And I imagine all of us, whether that scenario or others, we have found at times defining on our own terms the placement of justice. The placement of justice. And so the main point I want to highlight today from this text is not to laugh when your siblings... No, just kidding. The main point I want to highlight from this text is that justice is the foundation upon which our faith is built. Now, this psalm opens up with praising God in, in somewhat general terms. And, and what is celebrated early on, verses 1 and 2, is then developed into a hymn of sort. In verses 5 through 14. And this hymn focuses on the wonders and the faithfulness of the Lord. We see even in verse 11 that everything that owes its existence to God joins in on this hymn of praise. And while scholars uh, differ on the particular origins of the psalm, what we do know and what is clear is that this psalm has the power to speak to any situation of crisis in the life of the community. When events might tempt us to call into question the promises God has made. When my dad looked at me in that moment or other moments, even when I knew the discipline was there, there was just I had there's no recourse like it was coming. I remember trying to muster up every promise of God. You said you'd never leave me, Lord. You said you'd never forsake me. Where are you? Where's that secret place? Was it Psalm 91? Where's that secret place? Show it, show it to me so I can find it right now and hide so they can't find me. Valley of the shadow of death. I'm walking through it now and I'm fearing everything up in this camp. Help me, Lord. Where are you? And more seriously, in the season we find ourselves in right now, perhaps we find ourselves crying out. It's been hundreds of years, Lord. Where are you? Where are you? And yet the truth is that God's kingship rests on the qualities that the Psalms in particular attribute to the Lord over and over and over and over again. The qualities of righteousness and justice, steadfast love and faithfulness. And as the verse we've read today says, righteousness and justice, in fact, are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 97 and 2 echoes the truth in saying clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And love and faithfulness or love and truth, as the message translation says, are its fruits. Now, as, as somewhat of a backdrop, not just to today, but really uh, to, 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 as a backdrop to the next few weeks as we talk about justice, I want to talk a little bit about those words, righteousness and justice, and, and beginning with righteousness, because there are two particular words in Hebrew for righteousness. One is interpreted more in a relational, dynamic sense. The other in more of a static sense. So there's relationship, I'm sorry, there's righteousness in terms of relationships among people and of a person to God in terms of how faithful each other are uh, to each other's expectations. Um, and, and a good example of that would be uh, in Genesis chapter 30, when Jacob is making his proposal to Laban in verse 33 of chapter 30 of Genesis says, so shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come when it shall come for my hire before thy face. One, one side or one word for righteousness. Um, on the other hand, righteousness as an abstract or as the legal status of a relationship is also present in Scripture, in particular the Old Testament. And so we see that in Genesis 15, where it said it is credited to or counted to him as righteousness, him being Abraham. And the books of Psalms and the prophets typically use the sense of righteousness as a state. Having said that, both of those are legal terms, both signifying justice in conformity with the law, Deuteronomy 16 and 20, the judicial process, Jeremiah 22 and 3, the justice of the king as judge, 1 Kings 10 and 9, Psalm 119 and 21, and Proverbs 8 and 15 as references, and also the source of justice, God himself. 
Psalm 35, 24 and 28 that I'll read says, Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness and let them not rejoice over me. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. And the word righteousness also embodies all that God expects of his people, which we'll get to in a moment. And so justice then is a concrete expression of righteousness. And justice is the foundation upon which our faith is built. Why? Well, to get to the point, because justice is what led Jesus to the cross to begin with. Romans 3, 20, Romans 3 and 23 says the wages of sin is death. And as such, there had to be payment for those sins. Justice demanded that there be atonement for the sins of humankind, you and me. And he, being a just and loving God, sent his only son to die for our sins. Justice applied. And, when, and we now, then, through, through our faith in a just God, are justified and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, Romans 5 and 1 says. But then James says, chapter 2, verse 14, that our faith without works is dead. Quick parenthetical. I have no idea with the protesters now and in previous years when they chant no justice, no peace, if they're thinking about this thread of verses that we've just discussed. But really, there's no peace with God for us without justice. There's no reconciliation without justice. Justice was the bridge across the gap that separated me and you, that separated us from God. And justice, even horizontally amongst us, is the bridge that will give reconciliation a chance. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if it's righteousness, if, if righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, then it's the foundation upon which our faith rests. And we have some agency in justice. Agency, through my educator lens, is uh, means that we as students of the word of God, we, we get to have a voice in and a choice in how we learn. Isaiah 1 and 17 says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. An agency is all about the capacity to take purposeful initiative and know that it's not to be confused with being able to save ourselves. Absolutely not. God is the only one that can do the heart change and the heart work that is needed in this land. He's the only one. And yet he gives us, though, the opportunity to do the hard work, not to be confused, though, with the heart work, though, by the grace of God, through our hard work, may we shine a light clearly on the door through which people can go to see the God of justice more clearly, the God of love more clearly, the God of reconciliation more clearly. And when we. Don't act justly. When we look at Micah chapter 6, verse 8, when, 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 when that isn't our portion, it's almost like putting more, more bedposts in the room of our community in the dark when they're trying to get to the bathroom. Lord, forgive me. Bathroom, Jesus, not a parallel. Every now, natural analogy falls short. But it's like metaphorically putting more bedposts in the way. Anybody with me? Anybody stumble to the bathroom and just about lose their life, stumping their toe on that bedpost? You feel like life is over. You're like, forget the bathroom. I'm not going to make it through the night. Give me the astronaut paper so I don't have to get up again when it's dark. When we fail to act justly, we're just putting bedposts all in the way. And meanwhile, people are saying, I'm trying to find the bathroom. Go help me. I'm trying to find Jesus. I'm trying to get to Jesus and I'm stumbling through, stumping my toe on all of these acts of injustice everywhere. You know what? Forget it. Forget it, God. I don't see you anywhere. I'm, I'm struggling just trying to stumble through all of these bedposts that I keep hitting my toes on. It's too painful. What kind of God is there that would allow this to happen? We get the opportunity 
Oh, to minimize those through our hard work. And so God can do the hard work once they can see more clearly who he is. And I want to come back to that main point, though, of justice being the foundation upon which our faith is built. It's not an add on. It's not we've got these great sort of programs and this is happening. And oh, man, if we're if we're really fortunate, we can throw some reconciliation and justice in there. No, this is foundational to who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Foundational. So when we see injustice of any kind, it's our devotion to Jesus whose throne is built on justice that then prompts us to purposeful action. And to be clear, I, I'm not just talking about justice in uh, uh, specific cases, though absolutely uh, very important. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and many others, justice is warranted. But I'm also talking about the long-standing injustices that permeate, that directly conflict with the Bible we read. Now, if you're if you're if you're listening to this and the Bible isn't your roadmap for life, then we we have a different conversation. And I'd be open to just listening to what your moral compass is and and and, and how you define injustice and how you go about writing said injustices. I'd be open to listening to that. And if given the opportunity, I would share that that my Bible which I believe, according to 2 Timothy 3 and 16, is the inspired word of God, says in James 1, chapter 17, that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and the widows. In other words, the marginalized and oppressed and the outcast, to look after them in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And if we are not, Matthew 7, 26 says, we are building our house on sand. I don't know about you, but I want this here house to be built on a solid rock. This individual house, our more corporate victory church house, the Charlottesville community, the nation, the house, God, that you've called us to build. We want to build it on the solid rock that you and who you are. And I encourage you just as we close even. As we go about this week, pick a day, pick a day to fast and to pray and to ask God to discern what it looks like for justice to be the foundation upon which our faith is built. Pick one day, fast, pray, seek God, and I trust that he will meet all of us there. Ask him, God, how might my life reflect more <laughs> of justice being at the foundation because it's at the foundation of your throne. And what I imagine is a community that testifies to the righteousness and justice of God through our lives. Such that we can experience even more good news. I shared the, the, some good news earlier, the good news, and that his justice led to our being able to be reconciled to him. And now there's more good news we find in Psalm 106 and 3 that says, blessed are those who act justly. Anybody want to be blessed? I do. I do. And as we go about this series, I trust that you will hear the Lord through his scripture calling us higher in terms of how we are ambassadors and, and, and ambassadors of his kingdom and bearers of his image here in the earth. And as we do so, we are going to talk about Psalm 82 talks about how we defend the unjust intentionally, maybe unintentionally, but how we do that, how we show partiality to the wicked. We are going to walk through that and more to, to, to do some to let God do some spiritual surgery on the inside of us so that we can produce, so that he can produce in and through us that which reflects his kingdom best and his will in heaven can be done here on earth. That's our prayer. That's our desire during this time. And I pray that you plug in, plug in, and we'll have some other folks who will come and help facilitate that. In fact, next week, we'll kick off with uh, the chief of police here in the city of Charlottesville, Chief Rochelle Brackney, who's going to help us see... Uh, a faith and justice with, 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 within the realm of law, a field she's been in for a long time. 
And so I'm praying for God to meet us there and in future weeks where we have other conversations so that we individually and as a community can be salt in the earth, can be light in darkness. And as we, as I pray, as we embody Jesus, oh, the, the ultimate goal is to make Jesus more recognizable. Because when Jesus is recognized, people are reconciled. And Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of agency in justice here in the earth that you allow us to have. We know you are the God of justice and, and you do all of the hard work. And, and, and we, we, we acknowledge and recognize it's your power working in and through us. And yet we want to steward that which you have given us to steward, being the ministry of reconciliation, as 2 Corinthians 5 and 18 says. And so we, may, we, may we steward the agency in justice accordingly, such that we can, we can lay out a bridge across which disparate and divided groups in our culture can walk across and experience reconciliation. And may we do that, that, God, as worship unto you. With your eyes closed and your heads bowed, I, 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 I want to invite those who, list, who are listening to this and saying, I, I, the Bible isn't my roadmap. But I want the Bible to be my roadmap. I'm talking to you now. And, and all I want to do in this moment is pray with and for you. If that is you, and you want Jesus to be your roadmap, pray this prayer with me today. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I repent today of all of my sins. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I commit to following you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the heavens, the, the angels in heaven rather are rejoicing and so do we. It's the greatest decision you will have ever made. And as you might have gathered just listening today, but certainly as you if you've listened for any uh, number of, of, of Sundays uh, at, of Victory Church, that we believe, according to the word of God, that we live out this life of faith in community. And so we want to know that you've made that decision. Uh, whether you're near or far, we want to know. So click the, the link there on your screen that says you've given your life to Christ so that we can send you uh, some free materials that will help you with next steps, how you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are local and want to connect more, we can do that as well. Um, and if you are listening or watching this and you want to uh, have somebody to pray with, either about making that decision or just any other pressing need in your life, you can also click the live prayer button also seen on your screen there. And our prayer team, uh, who is amazing, uh, shout out to the prayer team. They are there to pray with and for you as well. The Bible says with two or three are gathered in his name and we're going to throw online in there in this season. God is in the midst and so he'll meet you there. Please click on that link and experience prayer with our prayer team. Amen? Amen. Uh, at this time, I want you to take a moment or two. We are going to go to the Lord's table. Uh, praise God for an opportunity to remember, uh, speaking of justice, to remember what he did on the cross for you and for me. So take a moment, uh, grab whatever you have, juice, crackers, whatever you have. They are going to be symbols representing his body and blood. So go do that and we will uh, partake in a moment together. Communion is a celebration of the gospel. The gospel being that Jesus took on our sin and received the wages for those sins, which was death, in our place. And in so doing, we now have the opportunity to be whole through him. And communion is for anyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, which can be you right now. If you have not said yes to him, you can do so in this moment. The Bible does say, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, that we ought not come to the Lord's table in an unworthy or irreverent manner. And so I want to give us 10 or so seconds just to examine our hearts, to examine our hearts and repent of any thought or deed or any way that we know we've fallen short, and uh, to ponder, to ponder 
and, and uh, revere the sacrifice made on the cross on our behalf. So let's take about 10 seconds and just examine our hearts. Bible says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, beginning at the latter part of verse 23, that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25 says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that your blood has not lost its power. We thank you, Lord, that it all begins at the cross. We meet at the foot of the cross. And if not for your taking on our sins, dying a death we should have died, We're not here. There's no life. But because you chose justice, because you chose to, to pay the wages on our behalf for our sin, then rising from the dead three days later, we now have the opportunity to live, to move, and to have our being in you. For that, we are grateful. And we acknowledge today, in this season we are in and forevermore, that the blood of the, the blood shed on Jesus' cross, God, that we know it. It has not, nor will it ever lose its power. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And amen. Family, we are in love with Jesus, and we are unapologetic, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So grateful for him and what he continues to do in our midst. May you experience the victory won on the cross. Uh, circumstances not being perhaps what we want them to be, when we want them to be them, this season or any other. May we look beyond the hills, Psalm 121 say, to see where our help comes from, from he who was omnipotent and omniscient. In Jesus' name, family, love you. Uh, let's live in victory. See you soon.